want to welcome everyone uh, to this discussion, the future of criminal justice reform. My name is David Greenwald. I am the founder and director of the Vanguard. This is our 11th annual fundraiser and the second of which has been remote due to COVID. Although we did uh, manage to do an in-person event last month in Sacramento in the 105 degree heat. Those of you uh, in the audience who are there know what I mean. Um, I'm in the much more comfortable confines of my office, although it's actually a little warm in here and the air conditioning is no longer working. So it is what it is. Uh, today, we have an amazing panel of speakers who will be talking about one of the most important issues of our time, the future of criminal justice reform. And it's kind of ironic because the way uh, we planned this out back in January, so, you know, nine and a half months ago, still during the Trump administration, if you can imagine that, um, you know, we, we thought that uh, this was going to be a little bit different uh, show than uh, it may turn out to be. Uh, back in January, we were coming off a year where there were mass protests uh, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. Uh, we had seen a large number of uh, high profile uh, progressive prosecutors get elected. Uh, and there was a real sense of optimism. Um, since then, uh, we've seen maybe uh, a backlash against reform policies. Uh, we'll talk to the panelists about that, uh, whether uh, they see that or not. Uh, we've seen uh, a spike in the murder rate, uh, the perception at least that crime is on the rise, and the blame by some that reform uh, movements have led us to this point. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our speakers for our discussion tonight, uh, but, I, but I did want to take a moment to uh, recognize the growth of the Vanguard organization. Back in 2006, I founded the Vanguard. It was a small blog. It was created in response to a police issue in the city of Davis, which for those of you who don't know, is a small college town about 15 minutes away from Sacramento. In 2010, in response to a wrongful conviction, we started our first court watch. And I'll never forget gathering around the table at Round Table Pizza, our six interns, as we were planning to go into the court for the first time. Um, you know, flash forward to seven years later in 2017, we expanded by launching our Sacramento Court Watch. In 2019, we started our San Francisco Court Watch just after the tragic death of Jeff Adachi, the public defender there for a long time. And now with the pandemic, we've seen explosive growth, ironically enough. Um, as Jonathan was mentioning before, uh, we, we formally started you know, we learned a lot of things that we could do remotely that we didn't really know about before. Uh, the ability to organize over Zoom has been really a revelation. Um, and so currently we have established court watches in six different counties, Sacramento, Yolo, Alameda, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, and LA. We have regular court coverages of no less than 10 courtrooms across the state of California, with as many as 80 interns across the state. And one thing that we really take pride in is the fact that last year, over 50 of our interns from the previous year ended up going to law school this year. And a huge percentage of them were young women of color. Um, so that's a huge point of pride for us. Um, and next year, we're hoping to be able to do a whole lot more. Every intern that we put into the courts enables us to shine a little bit of light on the criminal legal system, to expose the types of everyday injustices that would otherwise go unnoticed and unreported without our work. 
I was describing to someone the other day that what we do, and, and they responded, well, you must have a huge staff to be able to manage all those interns. But the reality is that we operate on an everyday basis with just six staff members. And um, six is actually a big increase over what it was uh, when the pandemic started, when it was me and Danny. Uh, so, uh, so it's been a, a big work in progress. Um, and, uh, you know, it's events like this that help us keep the lights on. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who has contributed to our success. Uh, we'll be recognizing our sponsors throughout the evening as we did before uh, the event started. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel in a second, but I wanted to let everyone know that unfortunately, San Francisco DA Chase Bodine at the last minute had a conflict that he could not get out of, uh, but he did agree to do an interview with me over Zoom this afternoon. Uh, so that is going to be uh, the first thing that we do is play that interview, and then I will introduce the panel, and uh, we will start the bulk of our discussion. Hi, everyone. We have with us uh, San Francisco DA Chesa Bodine. Unfortunately, uh, the DA uh, had a scheduling conflict that came up at the last moment. And so he was not able to attend live, but he has agreed uh, to uh, sit for this brief interview where he'll answer the same questions as the other panelists. So DA, if you don't mind uh, giving us a quick introduction to yourself. Absolutely, well, thank you, David. And I, I'm very sorry not to be able to attend live. As you say, uh, I'd hope to be there. and I look forward to joining in the future. My name is Chase Boudin and I'm proudly serving as San Francisco's elected district attorney. I was sworn into office in January 2020, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and I came to this role in a little bit of an unusual uh, path. I was, uh, I grew up as the child of incarcerated parents. My biological parents spent most of my life in prison. My mother served 22 years. My father has served more than 40 years in prison. And as a result, I grew up thinking about crime and punishment and public safety. And I went to law school full of hope to reform a system that is not serving our needs, that is not making our community safe, that is not um, focusing on rehabilitation or centering crime victims in ways that heals after the, 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 the harm that they've suffered from crime and from violence. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here in San Francisco. I hope we get to talk about that a little bit today. So. The last nearly two years now, we've gone from mass protests because of the George Floyd killing, large numbers of progressive prosecutors were elected during the elections at various times. And now at the same time, we've seen kind of this record spike in murders, a narrative of rising crime, we can talk about that. And, and really underlying all of this is kind of a polarization in this country. Uh, with that framework in mind, where do we go from here? Well, you know, I want to emphasize that San Francisco has seen uh, declines in crime across the board in most key categories. Homicide is up slightly, uh, and tragically, every homicide is one too many, of course. Um, if we're looking at empirical evidence and data in San Francisco, unlike places like Sacramento, for example, Oakland, uh, and so many jurisdictions across the country that are being led by so-called tough on crime prosecutors, our homicide rate is hovering almost exactly at its 56 year low. Um, now, we do have real challenges with gun violence. We do have real challenges, of course, with property crime in San Francisco as across the country. I think where we go from here, David, to the heart of your question is we have to remember that the, the failed policies of the tough on crime era that led to mass incarceration, that led to horrific racial disparities in our communities and in our jails and prisons, are failed policies. They didn't work. They were never supported by empirical evidence. And the fact that certain crimes may trend up or that news coverage or viral videos of crime may be trending upwards doesn't in any way justify going backwards to policies that we know make us less safe, to policies that we know bankrupt our local governments and starve them of the money that is actually needed 
if we're serious about public safety, to get at the root causes of crime, to invest in education and healthcare and housing and employment, the kinds of things that actually build safe and vibrant communities, the kind of communities that I want to be proud to raise my eight-week-old son in. Um, and so kind of spinning off of that a little bit, are, are we seeing a backlash against reforms or is this kind of uh, a weird time with COVID? The courts have been largely shut down. Uh, the world has not resembled what uh, we knew normal life to be, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic. So, you know, on the one hand, are we seeing a blip here or is this kind of, are we going back to a different time uh, in terms of crime rate and, uh, and a backlash against reforms? You know, on a micro level, the statistics and the data doesn't mean much if you or someone you love was victimized by a crime recently. And so we have to remember that there are always going to be individual people who are victims or survivors of crime who need our support, who need intervention in some way to undo the harm and to seek accountability. If you zoom out at a bigger level, um, what we're seeing is police unions and Republican operatives exploiting individual tragedies to undo reforms that are based in evidence, based in racial justice, and based in decades of learned experience about how we can build safe and just communities. And they're doing it really effectively with the help of a lot of mainstream media outlets that have realized, as has been true for decades, if it bleeds, it leads. And so there's a public perception driven by social media and viral videos, driven by police union talking points, that is sadly totally divorced from reality when it comes to policies, data, and evidence. Ultimately, are you seeing this being successful or do you think that reforms will prevail? I'm absolutely confident that reforms will prevail. First of all, this is a national reform movement. It's growing, it's building momentum, and it has not yet even had enough time to fully prove all the ways in which it can be effective. We have had decades of failed experience with things like three strikes and you're out, with, with things like uh, pretextual traffic stops, with things like gang enhancements or the death penalty. We don't need to go back to those failed policies. Um, of course, there are always going to be some people who will uh, buy into the police union rhetoric and the Republican uh, Party rhetoric. Uh, however, it's not going to be successful because what we're doing is actually making cities safer. It's empowering crime victims. It's saving resources for the things that matter most to our communities. And because at the end of the day, the um, police unions have a very, very loud soapbox, but they do not represent our values. They do not speak for the voters of San Francisco or anywhere in the state of California. And along that, that line, you know, I remember when I was a good deal younger, um, you know, Dukakis running in 1988 uh, was really browbeat for his association with the ACLU, his opposition to the death penalty, um, of course, you know, the infamous Willie Horton ad. And so what we saw after he was beaten over these issues is really for a generation, uh, Democrats were unwilling to engage on these issues. Do you see that happening again or do you think we've come too far? The police unions would love it, and they're trying hard to make that a reality for me and for other reformers. They're trying to suggest or to create a narrative that suggests that anytime a crime occurs, it's somehow the responsibility of uh, a reform prosecutor. You don't see that narrative being used in tough on crime jurisdictions. You don't see that same uh, logic being applied in the media or from um, the, the Republican Party operatives and police unions when it comes to tough on crime uh, DAs like the one in Sacramento, where murder rates have skyrocketed. Uh, I wouldn't say, notwithstanding her tough on crime policies, I would say in part because of those policies that have for generations torn apart families and systematically starved communities of the kinds of things that build safety. And so um, I'm, I'm optimistic that these attempts will fail. I think the level of public awareness and education about racial justice issues, about Black Lives Matter issues, about the excesses of police unions and the dishonesty, frankly, of so many of their talking points, is, uh, is the, the level of public awareness is much greater today than it was when Dukakis um, had his so-called Willie Horton moment. 
Um, and I, I have no doubt that that's a playbook they're trying to, um, to operate out of um, when it comes to undoing racial justice policies, but it's not going to be effective today. We've come too far. And then at a comparative level, you know, um, it, it's easy to point the finger at progressive DAs, but, you know, we have the nice little comparison point, San Francisco to Oakland. San Francisco has a progressive prosecutor. Oakland has what we'll call a traditional prosecutor. And Oakland has a skyrocketing murder rate. As you said, your murder rate's almost flat. Um, so it seems like it's not policy driven. It, it's something systemic. That's, a, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the other way to look at it, David, is any prosecutor, I don't care what your politics or what your party is, um, any prosecutor who could snap their fingers and implement some policy that would eliminate murder would do it. Every one of us wants to see homicides go down to zero. I don't, I don't care what our disagreements are. Um, and it hasn't happened anywhere in the country. We haven't figured out how, partly because there are guns being dumped onto our streets, partly because of longstanding system, systematic and intentional underinvestment in certain communities of color, partly because of all these other things that feed into um, lack of safety. It can't be solved just by locking people up. And so um, I think what, you know, what we need to start doing, and this is, this is exactly what we've been doing in my office, is attacking the problem at its root. That's why I filed a historic lawsuit against three ghost gun manufacturers, companies that are dumping illegal firearms into the hands of people who aren't even allowed to purchase firearms. Uh, that's how we prevent the next homicide. It's not by waiting for the homicide to occur and then seeking the death penalty against the person the police arrest, right? We've got to be proactive. That's what being a progressive prosecutor is about. And looking at the data and comparing side to side jurisdictions like San Francisco and Sacramento or Oakland or others, you can see uh, as plain as day that the legacy of things like our young adult court and our behavioral health court of focusing on mental health care and drug treatment for folks who are suffering from those afflictions in our criminal legal system is a far more effective, humane, and cost-efficient way to build safety than it is to simply seek the maximum punishment in a state prison every single chance you get, which is sadly how most prosecutors in this country have operated for decades. And I wanted to ask you briefly about, uh, you know, the high profile shoplifting incidents in, in San Francisco. One thing that that's really striking to me is, uh, you know, uh, the problem seems to be that the people are not getting into the system in the first place because the police are not getting there in time or they're not even bothering to come out. So what can a prosecutor do under those circumstances? You can't arrest them. That's right. And it's, it's been frustrating for us, David, to see both the misinformation about why Walgreens is closing and about what uh, property crime rates are in San Francisco. To be clear, reported property crime fell by uh, about 40 percent in my first year in office. Larceny, theft, uh, including auto burglary, is down about 40 percent. Overall crime down about 20 percent. And one of the Walgreens that's closing only reported about two thefts a month um, and it's closing. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, um, uh, misinformation that's being spread with an agenda when it comes to this issue. And to your point, you know, to the extent people want to see a prosecutor file criminal charges, secure a conviction and a sentence, we can only do that when police make an arrest. And in San Francisco, police historically make arrests in these cases in about 3% of reported incidents. That means 97% of the time a theft gets reported or an auto break-in gets reported. My office, whether it's under my leadership or now Vice President Kamala Harris or uh, now District Attorney of LA Gascon, we only get to swing uh, at the pitch about three out of every hundred times. Um, that's not really enough to make a difference using that traditional uh, prosecution approach. That's why I'm focused on root causes. That's why I wanna make sure every single arrest we do see is an opportunity to intervene and transform lives away from crime to break this revolving door that's been such a defining feature of America's addiction to incarceration. And then finally, you know, trying to uh, look into the future a little bit, you know, we still have major systemic problems, mass incarceration, police accountability, um, and massive racial inequity in the criminal legal system. From your perspective, what can we do to solve these things? 
Well, I think what we've got to do is start really focusing on root causes of crime, you know, and and remembering that the criminal legal system as it exists today is uh, is a system, is a massive punitive bureaucracy that was built up over decades and, and that can be traced and has by folks like Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis all the way back to slavery. It's not an accident that we have a system that over incarcerates African American men. It's not an accident that we have a system that destroys families in ways that have absolutely no correlation to reducing crime or to rehabilitation. It's not an accident that in California, 2% of the Department of Corrections budget, just 2% goes to rehabilitation, right? And so what we've got to do is we've got to start focusing on what our priorities actually are, preventing crime supporting victims and making sure that those who are being held accountable by our system are coming out after their sentence or after their probation in ways that sets them up to succeed rather than guarantees failure. Those three things are essential if we're going to build safe communities, if we're going to build strong communities. Well, we're just about out of time. I wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, share your thoughts with us. Thank you, David. Appreciate your work. And sorry, I can't be there with you all live. Uh, we'll be next year, hopefully in person. Take Thanks, care. Chesa. Thank you. All right. And want to thank uh, Chesa uh, for taking time out of his work schedule to do that. Um, sorry he couldn't be here live and uh, take some of your guys' questions. Uh, but uh, we do have three excellent panelists uh, here with us to continue th this discussion. Um, and so I'm going to introduce you guys one at a time. I'd like uh, for each of you to take a minute or two to just uh, give a brief introduction as to who you are and uh, what you do. So we're going to start with Melina Abdullah. Sure. Hi, I'm Melina Abdullah, and uh, my day job is as a professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. Um, and what I'm here for is because I'm one of the founding members of Black Lives Matter. I'm director of Black Lives Matter Grassroots, which is all of the on the ground work that we do as Black Lives Matter around the world. And I'm co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. A lot of the work that we do focuses on progressive justice reform. So how do we, as an abolitionist group who recognizes what Dr. Youssef Salam says, that this is a criminal system of injustice. It was deliberately designed to produce the outcomes that it does. It was de deliberately designed to put targets on the backs of our people. Um, it was de deliberately designed for all of the components of it to really converge and um, create harm, conditions of harm for Black communities in particular, as we seek to dismantle um, an unjust system and build new systems that are grounded in true models of justice. Um, there's a concept called uh, survival pending revolution. And, you know, in this moment when this criminal system of injustice is here, and so many of us are tied up in this system, how do we usher in progressive and meaningful justice reform that actually reduces harm and brings some semblance of justice in names like the name Mona Rodriguez? I heard Chesa Boudin mention the DA of Los Angeles County, um, George Gascon, who charged, this is a very, very rare situation where um, an officer, a, a officer who was just fired for um, you know, this, this murder was actually charged with the murder of 18 year old Long Beach Unified School student, Millican High School student, uh, Mona Rodriguez, who was killed um, as she fled an after school fight by a Long Beach school safety officer. And so progressive justice reform is about having um, meaningful reforms that can bring some semblance of justice, even as we work to build new systems and dismantle ones that don't work for us. And I'm grateful to be in community um, with the folks who I share this panel with, um, namely Jody Armour, um, who um, I have the privilege of working with and talking with and thinking with um, on a regular basis, as well as an entire team um, from Black Lives Matter and those who are with allied groups like White People for Black Lives 
um, in kind of working on these these big issues, which include the um, one of our major campaigns now. It had been Jackie Lacey must go. We got her gone and now have the new, new DA. Um, but we're now also taking head on the police associations. I would dare to say, you know, I very rarely um, disagree with Chase Boudin, but I'll disagree with this. Police associations are not unions. They parade themselves to be unions. They are not unions. They are organized crime. They only act upon their own very narrow self-interest to the detriment of every other working class person. So they are not unions. And one of the things we're working on now is um, our end police associations campaign, um, recognizing that point. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to next introduce uh, Jody Armour. Hi, um, yeah, I've, I've been um, teaching criminal law at USC for about 25 years. Uh, took an interest in this subject as a result of my dad being the victim of a no-knock raid and sentenced to 22 to 55 for possession and sale of marijuana. Um, as an eight-year-old, that was my early introduction to the criminal justice system and the wonders of the law. Um, but my, I'm really kind of uh, heartened to, this evening to be back with Melina and at least in spirit, uh, Chase Boudin, because the, the last time I was out in the world before COVID struck was when we were all three in San Francisco um, and um, Chesa was going to uh, talk to the media as he did right after our conversation earlier in that morning and announced two new directives uh, for coming out of his and aimed at the uh, prosecutors in his office, uh, namely one, um, gang enhancements out, two, um, and this was for me like, the, the most uh, interesting and momentous in some ways, if you are acquire contraband as a result of a pretextual stop, we're not going to prosecute, okay? We're not going to be in the business of encouraging that kind of behavior because we know what that behavior is. What, what pretextual stop mean, folks? Because I, I think a lot of times, I, I never, I didn't even really for a while really get this clearly, right? A, 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 a officer is looking at a young black male behind the wheel of a car. All he has is a hunch that that's a criminal. He doesn't have a reasonable suspicion. It doesn't rise to that level. So he doesn't have Fourth Amendment grounds to do anything about his hunch. But if he sees a fragrance dispenser, dispenser hanging from his rear view mirror or a crack in his taillight, now he can, on that pretext, act on his hunch. He's pulling the kid over, not for the fragrance hanging from his mirror, right? That's the pretext. He's pulling them over because he's young and black, right? And he had a hunch. And so we have, you know, encouraged that kind of behavior, codified it, and, and encouraged cops to become the kind of people that play those kind of rules. So I'm, I'm so glad to be back in, you know, and every, I, I, um, I happened to write, start writing the book that I, I recently written, uh, Nigga Theory, Race, uh, uh, language unequal justice in the law, uh, right around the time um, Melina Abdullah, Patrice Colors, and others here in LA were really going strong, getting the Black Lives Matter movement going right after George Zimmerman had been acquitted in the Trayvon Martin killing. Then a year later, Michael Brown was in the streets. And so I got to see, you know, I got to spend a lot of time with them. We were going together before the media and talking about these, you know, unarmed and and just black folks in general getting, getting slayed by, by police. And that's where a lot of my thinking and scholarship have come from. You know, I gotta, you know, like we do in scholarship, you gotta footnote, you gotta give citation, you gotta, you know, give, give credit where it's due. So that's where I called Melina Abdullah, the professor of praxis. You know, she has both the theory, gives master classes in theory and practice. Well, thank you. and. Uh... That day in San Francisco, I remember well, I was in the audience and who knew that the world was gonna shut down in two weeks. Um, but that was, uh, that was a great event. Um, and Jody mentioned his book, uh, thankfully, because I can't mention that name. Uh, 
Uh, but it is one of my favorite books that I've read in the last year, as was the book by Jonathan Rapping, uh, who is our third panelist here. Uh, welcome, Jonathan. Yeah, David, thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here with uh, Jody and Melina. Uh, I am the odd person out. I'm not from California. I'm in Georgia, uh, although I haven't always been in Georgia. I, I came here oh, about 17 years ago. Uh, I am a law professor at Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, where I direct our criminal justice certificate program. But what I spend um, the bulk of my time doing when I'm not teaching is Along with my wife, we co-founded a nonprofit by the same name as the book, Gideon's Promise. Um, so, so I started my career as a public defender in Washington, D.C. And like several public defender offices in California, it was really sort of a model office with, with caseloads that were manageable, was well-resourced. Um, and I spent a decade learning to be a public defender there before moving to Georgia to do criminal justice reform in the Deep South. And I think when I got to the Deep South, what I recognized um, was that really the challenge at its core that we were facing was a cultural challenge. I saw countless really well-intentioned people, young law students, right, graduating, wanting to do good work, going into systems that had come to accept such a low standard of justice that within a couple of years, they either had to quit or worse, start to become resigned to the status quo, right? Have the passion beaten out of them. And so my wife and I started a nonprofit to really try to not just train public defenders who represent over 80% of the people charged with crimes, the vast majority of people charged with crimes um, cannot afford to hire lawyers, um, disproportionately black and brown people, people of color. Uh, and we built an organization to try to help public defenders First, hold on to the values that brought them into the system. And second, form a collective to start to transform the culture within the, those offices. And third, transform those offices into vehicles to start to push back against systemic assumptions, to drive systemic change. Um, I, I will say we've, we, we have been, uh, for the last 18 months, dealing with this pandemic. And I really do think that that in some ways, not only because I've learned Zoom, but, but in some ways, um, it's been an educational experience. Uh, we, we all, as a nation, watched uh, as, as George Floyd was killed here in Atlanta, Rashad Brooks. We all um, have been hearing about Breonna Taylor, and I think it sort of awakened our nation in a way to a reality that has always been there, but but started to become more visible with the advent of cell phone footage and as people were sort of in their living rooms watching TV more. Uh, and we saw massive um, uprisings across the country. Uh, but, but I think what, what public defenders deal with uh, every day are the people who actually survive police encounters. The vast majority of people survive police encounters and they're thrown into a criminal legal system where they're subjected to a different kind of violence, right? It's a, it's a routine violence, it's normalized violence, it's an invisible violence that happens where there are no cell phones, where CNN isn't broadcasting. It happens when people are taken from their families and put in cages on money bonds they can't afford. It happens when prosecutors overcharge. It happens when, when, when judges give draconian sentences and it is destroying vulnerable communities every day and it goes unnoticed and public defenders collectively have the potential if we actually recruit, train, and support them the right way to be a critical engine to interrupt that violence that often goes unnoticed. And that's really the work of Gideon's Promise. And, and, and it, it is complementary to, and I think indispensable to, a broader vision of justice that the other panelists have and will be talking about. So I'm excited to be with you all. Well, thank you everyone for the, uh, the great introductions. And, and one thing, you know, when, when we kind of created this panel way back uh, in a different world, you know, my idea was, hey, we'll, we'll have a prosecutor, a public defender, a law professor, and somebody uh, working on uh, policing and uh, in the activist realm. And so, you know, I wanted to approach the questions from kind of very different uh, perspectives, even though 
there's obviously some shared uh, viewpoints here. Um, so to the audience, as you listen and you have a question, please post it in the Q&A. My staff is gonna go through and, uh, and, and help to ask questions of the panelists during the audience portion. Uh, and we'll try to get uh, to as many questions as possible. Um, so the first question um, is, uh, you know, we've seen in the last nearly two years now, um, you know, mass protests because of the George Floyd killing, large numbers of progressive prosecutors who were elected last year. And at the same time, uh, we've seen kind of this record spike in murder, uh, this narrative uh, that crime is increasing, and also this kind of underlying issue that, uh, you know, there's this massive polarization in this country, um, which, you know, you could argue historically may be unparalleled, or maybe you want to go back to the Civil War. I don't know where you want to uh, use your reference point, but, but we're definitely in a period of hyperpolarization. Uh, so my question is really, where do we go from here? Um, so let's see, let's start with Jody this time. Okay, yeah, um, I, I, man, I was listening with rapt attention to what D.A. Boudin was saying. I thought he was laying out a lot of um, where the battle is, where the battle lines are. He was identifying them, he, you know, he's being succinct and he was being uh, persuasive in the way that you have to be as a politician running for elective office, right? This is, uh, uh, you know, probably the most important kind of executive type politician out there, you know, because you do have, you know, you, 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 you're, you're running as a politician, but you have a much more executive function. You have to run a, an office here um, in, in LA, for example, um, it's over 1200 DAs that uh, George Gascon is, in, is responsible for. So I was, you know, really hardened to hear uh, the, the, the points he was hitting. Um, and I think that is, th th those are the places we need to go. You know, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Oakland. I, it's almost like a mantra, right? I, I, the, the power right now, we knew there was gonna be a backlash. Look, we're, we're here in LA, the streets were roiling for six weeks in a row with people demanding change. And we saw unprecedented change at the ballot box with not only George Gaston coming in and ousting um, Jackie Lacey, thanks to um, um, Ch uh, Black Lives Matter and Melina Abdullah and, and the, the, the effort of the grassroots activists uh, and making sure and bringing these criminal justice issues to the very forefront of uh, Angelino's minds and helping them, you know, helping inoculate them against police law enforcement rhetoric enough to get uh, Gascon over the over the line, even though I know, again, Black Lives Matter isn't politically partisan. I'm not saying that. But, you know, he, they, 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 they uh, really were not did not want to keep a law and order kind of DA who would refuse to hold police accountable like Jackie Lacey in there and, so, and were successful in the ballot box there. And then Measure J, which was a defund the police measure, 10% of the county of LA's unrestricted budget, which is up to $10 billion a year, $1 billion dedicated to non-incarceration alternatives, right? Those are jaw dropping victories that were won in criminal justice matters at the ballot box by what folks were doing out in the streets over those six weeks. But we knew there was gonna be a, a backlash, right? That this this doesn't come as a surprise, you know. Now, if you talk about inclusion, diversity, and equity, it is critical race theory, right? I mean, there, there's been a real struggle out here now uh, to to change the conversation, to reframe things, and we're, and the struggle is going to be over, you know, explaining things like spikes in homicide. People care about spikes in homicide, and again, I thought B B uh, Boudin was brilliant. San Francisco, Sacramento, and Oakland. Okay, now tell me, just do the math for me here. Help me out here. And, and then we can get into misinformation and journalism and um, DAs, you know, his point about DAs only getting to swing at three out of 100 pitches. So, look, the, the, the police aren't doing very well out here. That's why we're saddled with these spikes in crime. I mean, he has very succinct kind of messaging and that's where I think the battle is to uh, prevent the kind, any retrenchment in the, in the gains that we've made. 
Thank you. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, so I, I'd first just like to point out to the audience, I mean, there is a, there has been a rise in homicides, it's true. Um, they're not limited to places with quote unquote progressive DAs or that have strong defund the police movements. Th that, that rise has happened across the country in blue states and red states and places with more reform and less reform. It's coupled with um, a decrease in crime overall. And even with the higher crime rate than we had a year ago, it's still significantly less than it was in the 90s when I started as a public defender. And I, I, I think it is important, and I think uh, Chesa spoke to this, that it's important to resist this narrative that opponents of reform want to create around a spike in homicides as being the result of a progressive vision for criminal justice. Um, so, so I wanted to start by saying that. I, I think it is really hard to understand what the cause of that is, but to somehow suggest that it has anything to do with an ongoing struggle, a 400 year struggle for racial justice, an ongoing struggle for, for, for economic justice, it, that, that just seems to be cherry picking uh, ideas to fit your, 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 own, your own preferences. Um, but, but, but what I would like to, to say is this, and, and, and I should start by saying, um, I, I personally reject the notion. I, I don't believe there's such a thing as a progressive prosecutor. Um, I'm a big fan of Chesa Boudin, and I'm a big fan of, of people like him who are progressive people who become prosecutors and do what they can to create a less cruel, a less harmful system. But you can't be a progressive prosecutor in a system that has one answer to people who make mistakes, to marginalize people who make mistakes, and that is punishment. What you can do is you can try to, to ensure some people don't enter the system, by decriminalizing certain behavior or not charging certain crimes. Um, you can try to make sure they serve less time in cages, right, by doing away with gang enhancements and other things. But there will still be a large number of people who are thrown into a system where we have one way to deal with them, and it is a, an inhumane way of dealing with them. And so, so I think we need less punitive prosecutors, um, but I worry a little bit about us seeing that as the end all and be all solution and therefore not looking to all the other things that have to go along with it. Because when DAs like Chesa Boudin ensure that, the, that the, the, the population of people in the system shrinks by, I don't know what the numbers are, 10%, 20%, there's still a huge number of people that are gonna be need, needed to be seen as human beings in the spaces where so much damage is done. And quite frankly, even the most enlightened DAs, even the most progressive judges, can't exercise their decisions consistently with justice if they don't know anything about the human being standing next to them. And in this system, that only happens through public defenders. Those are the people, if they are trained right and they have the right mindset, they learn the stories. They tell the stories. They amplify voices that have been silenced. They infuse the system with humanity. So, so before turning it over, I want to just share one quick lesson I learned, and I'm learning all kinds of lessons every day of my life about sort of um, how I move through this space and how I do the work that I do. I've learned a lot of lessons as a lawyer. I've learned a lot of lessons as a father. So I, I'm a father to two children who have a black mother. They're black children. I'm clearly not a black man. And, and I think when I was maybe about, uh, maybe when my son was about six, five or six, I started to realize, right, that like I would drift through stop signs, or if someone cut me off, I might give them the finger. And I started to realize I had, I couldn't model for him how I move through the world, right? I had to model how he would have to move through the world. And it is really very different. And I think that until we all understand that, we can't create spaces that are safe for black and brown people. And, 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 and I will say as a parent, I think everything I know about, I don't even say punishment, because I think if we're thinking about punishment, we're already on a wrong foot. Everything I know about consequences comes from being a parent. 
right? I believe in consequences. My wife and I have rules. And when my children break one of the rules, we fashion consequences, right? Consequences designed to ensure that they are healthy and strong and productive, never designed to cripple them or crush them or, or end their ability to grow. And if you said to me, you know, rap, everyone calls me rap, so you all should call me rap. Say, you know, rap, if your son uses his PlayStation after hours when he's not supposed to, you have one way to punish him, and that is to lock him in a closet that is rat infested and feed and, and only feed him once a day. I would forgo those consequences. I'd say, you know what, I won't use any consequences if that's all you give me. And yet every day we take other people's children. We throw them into a space where we say, we want you to meet out consequences. And there's only one consequence, send them to hell, send them to a cage that is dangerous, right? And I think until all of us, defense lawyers, prosecutors, judges, refuse to treat anyone's child in a way they wouldn't treat their own, Right? We won't really have justice. So when I look at progressive prosecutors, absolutely end the gang enhancements, stop charging drug possessory offenses. But if you don't engage in the really hard work of transforming a culture, so the DAs in that office treat other people's children like they treat their own. And I've watched a couple of videos this week of DAs who have been calling, who have left the office and called for Chase's uh, 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 recall. Right. Those folks didn't embrace that culture. Chase inherited them. And if we don't change the culture so every DA, every judge has a more human-centered mindset, we're not going to have real reform. All right, Molina. I'm going to um, kind of pivot a little bit um, and try to directly answer your question about where do we go from here? Is that all right? Sure. I, I agree completely. And I really am processing what rap, I'm going to pretend like you're my friend because I, I plan to follow up with you, rap. Um, uh, I'm, I'm processing what rap is saying because I think that's right. And um, yeah, I'm processing that. But that I'm going to give you an answer that just is my response to your question, um, which is where do we go from here? And I think that when we all witnessed um, George Floyd be murdered on video for that nine minutes and 29 seconds, when we all witnessed and felt and couldn't look away because we were in the midst of a pandemic, um, we couldn't pretend like it wasn't happening. We couldn't not see the... Um, legacy of slave catchers that shone through Derek Chauvin's eyes. We couldn't pretend as if we didn't feel the life being um, ground out of George Floyd. And we had to sit with it and we had a choice. We had a choice to either accept a world that allows for the theft of, that, of Black life in that way or to rise up. Now, by the time George Floyd was murdered, Black Lives Matter had been doing work for the last seven years. We were born July 13th, 2013, which is the day that George Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And we've been doing work, some that was visible, most of it was invisible. Um, as Jody talks about, you know, the Jackie Lacey must go campaign, that was three and a half years in the making. Um, and work that included sometimes just five of us huddled in the rain in front of our office, chanting or not chanting, um, you know, making sure we never let a week go by without energy to get her out. And that was prompted by the twin sister of a sister named Keisha Michael, who was part of a um, couple that was murdered in Inglewood, California. Um, Keisha Michael and Mark Quentin Sandlin were in the car, sleeping in their car when Inglewood police, five Inglewood police officers killed these two parents who left seven children um, without care, right? Um, or without parents. 
And, you know, we were successful. Keisha Michael's twin sister, Trisha Michael, um, led us in a campaign where every week we were at Inglewood um, city council meetings demanding justice in the name of Keisha Michael and Mark Quentin Sandlin. And then finally we got the support of Maxine Waters and other folks and were able to get those five officers fired from Inglewood police. And in the midst of us celebrating that as a victory, Trisha said, no, no, because those cops can just go get jobs somewhere else. And so until they're prosecuted, we haven't won anything. And that's what kicked off the Jackie Lacey Must Go campaign. And so for three and a half years, you know, at a time really when people were thinking that Black Lives Matter was waning, right, we continued to pour in the work. And then, you know, we had the murder of George Floyd and the world cracked wide open, that everybody saw what we saw. And our five people or 50 people, and sometimes it would be 100 people on the steps of the halls of, uh, Hall of Injustice, but it turned into tens of thousands of people, right? Tens of thousands of people all saying Jackie Lacey must go. Tens of thousands of people recognizing what we've been chanting. We had been chanting defund the police since 2015, right? Because we felt like that was a more palatable chant than abolish the police, which is what we really meant, right? Um, that people who saw the budget and could see that pie chart, like regardless of their political stance, they would say, that's way too much money for police, right? And so we were saying defund the police and didn't even think of it as radical. It was really a budget demand, right? Um, and so we were doing that and you know, a year and a half ago, the world cracked wide open. Well, when we talk about where we go from here, you know, there's an African principle called Sankofa, which many of us know as a bird that's feet are uh, planted firmly facing forward. It's moving in a forward direction, but its head is turned um, completely backwards and it has an egg in its mouth rep representing the future. Um, meaning that it, in, in the, we say go back and fetch it is what Sankofa means, right? It means understand the lessons of the past as we move forward so we can forge a future that um, really means freedom for everyone, um, beginning with Black people. And I think that when we talk about our future, we have to remember that the murder of George Floyd cracked the world wide open, but who's holding that portal open is not just George Floyd's spirit, it's Anthony McLean's spirit, it's Dijon Kazee's spirit, it's Riddell Jones' spirit, it's Waukesha Wilson's spirit. And what they're demanding is that we do what we pledged to do on July 13th, 2013, which is build a movement, not a moment. And until we topple all of these systems of injustice, until we build a system, you know, um, Rap was talking about being a parent, Jody's a parent. I'm a parent, I'm a mother of three children, right? Who, um, you know, I just got off a plane and I had to really contemplate what it means to um, be away from my children for the next four days, right? Because my children take the bus home. And, you know, my Black children take the public bus home, you know? I know what kind of harassment my daughter receives, not by people in my Crenshaw district neighborhood who love and protect her, who she knows will keep her safe, but by the police who always ask her and her friends what they're doing, who follow them in and out of the black owned 7-Eleven that's on the corner, even though the owners love her, know her by name, the police treat her as a criminal. How do they see my son who's 11 years old, whose voice is changing, right? Who's almost as tall as me. And, you know, I'm proud and um, anxious at the same time. And so we have to build a world that's fit for their inhabitants. The future is each of us pledging to do all that we can to bring down the systems that make it unsafe for my children and Rap's children and Jody's children to walk the streets, to just exist, right? To even go to school, 
right? I think about Mona Rodriguez, right? I think about the children who were pepper sprayed at Dorsey High School and Crenshaw High School, right? Um, and the future is either we enable that system of kind of new slave catching to more firmly take hold, or we say we're going to honor the spirits that are holding that portal open, and we're going to go back and fetch those lessons of abolitionists who walk before us like Mama Harriet Tubman and forge a future that's fit for our children. Thank you. Um, so, you know, um, along the lines of what you guys just mentioned, I too have a 10 year old son who's half black and, and uh, he's gonna be six, four, 300 pounds when he grows up. Uh, he's already huge uh, at, at this age. And that is something that I always worry about. He's a big puppy dog, a big teddy bear, but uh, you know, at some point they may not see him that way and what's going to happen. Um, so I wanna use kind of the moderator's prerogative to tell a little bit of a, a, a story here um, because we've been talking about Chase uh, and San Francisco. And um, as, as most people here know, you know, Chase has been under fire. And on Sunday, um, a uh, very prominent uh, columnist slash reporter uh, wrote an article in, in the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, which detailed a, a, a former assistant uh, DA um, who resigned from the department and, and basically threw Chesa and his policies under the bus. And her name was Brooke Jenkins. And when I, when I saw that, uh, I immediately flashed to the first trial that we covered in San Francisco. It was a horrible child molestation trial, uh, a black man, uh, this is uh, in the summer of 2019. And this guy was facing life in prison and it became pretty clear to myself and our interns and the people covering the case that this guy was innocent, uh, that there was no way that this guy had access to this little girl um, and uh, that uh, uh, he was probably the victim of a custody dispute. But the worst part about this was uh, toward the end of the trial, um, the defense brought uh, their investigator forward to testify. And he had seen in the hallway, the DA, the victim's advocate and the DA investigator and, and a fourth adult surrounding this little five-year-old girl and, and browbeating her saying, you need to testify, you need to testify to this, you need to say that, say this, say that. Um, you know, clearly inappropriate probably uh, coaching the witness, definitely misconduct. Uh, and the DA in that case was Brooke Jenkins. And so I knew from the start reading that article that there was another side to the story. And I ran a response on Monday, but it wasn't until yesterday and today that I learned just how bad this story was. So today we ran an article uh, from the public defender who uh, was defending this murder trial in San Francisco. It was a high profile murder trial, it was a horrible murder, but uh, both the state's um, psychiatrist and uh, the defense psychiatrist both agreed that this, this man was legally insane. And so it should be an insanity case. Jenkins prosecuted, and it turned out this was her first murder trial. She prosecuted this case. Uh, it went, uh, he was naturally found guilty of the underlying crime. Then it goes to the insanity phase. She brings out a $40,000 uh, psychiatrist who she had hired to uh, basically be a yes man to them and say that this man wasn't insane even though the family of the victim all wanted this guy to be found insane. They believed that he was insane and, and, and shouldn't be incarcerated for this. Um, and, and then it gets worse. Um, I find out uh, from the chief uh, public defender today 
that this reporter, I had assumed that the reporter just didn't do her homework. It turns out she did her homework. She talked to the public defender. She talked to the chief public defender and she did not report on those conversations. So, so here is one of the more prominent reporters in San Francisco, basically lying by omission about what happened here. Um, and you know, I find it ironic because I'm always accused of being biased. I wouldn't have done that, something like that if I had talked to somebody and they had told me a different story. I'm, I'm reporting that. I may disagree with them, but I'm still reporting that. Um, so, so that situation in San Francisco and, you know, what Jody was saying with the media and everything, uh, you know, really rang a bell with me. Uh, so I wanted to really, you know, share this story. Um, so uh, we're gonna have um, a, a brief presentation by some of our interns talking about their experience. And then we'll be uh, back in a few minutes after that uh, to do the second and third questions from this panel. Um, so again, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I, during this time, I just wanna have a few of our interns come speak about our program. We have Kaylin, Coda, Alexander, and Orski who are joining us. Hi everyone, um, like Michelle said, my name is Kaylin. I'm currently a senior at UCLA. This is my last quarter before I graduate. And I started as a Vanguard Court Watch intern um, more than a year ago, actually now. Um, I started in August of 2020. Um, and truly this internship just opened so many doors for me and it ignited this passion for community engagement and social justice um, that I had, but this really, um, just elevated that for me. And like I said, I started in Court Watch. And then last year, um, I had the pleasure to serve as the um, editor of chief, editor in chief of the um, Los Angeles branch of the, the Vanguard. Um, it was a club that started at UCLA, ended up expanding to just have, um, have writers all over Los Angeles County, and getting to work with people all across LA and um, hear about they, we gave them options to write about news stories happening in their own Los Angeles communities, and I got to do that for my own community. And um, after that club, um, over the summer, I actually ended up getting an internship um, in community development for my own city because of um, of the reporting that I did on social justice issues in my own community and being able to talk about and understand social justice um, opened that door for me. And I've had the pleasure of serving as um a rental assistance case manager since then. And um, this this internship really just opened, um, ignited this passion in me to learn more about civic engagement, community engagement, social justice, how we can help out people in our own communities, and um, just how, how um, fundamental it is to have an understanding of the issues that are happening in your own community so that you can make a real positive impact and change. And um, I, I'm just so grateful to have um, been part of this program, and I hope that I can continue contributing where I can. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Coda. Uh, I'm a former intern and current employee of Vanguard. Uh, currently, I'm a senior at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm studying philosophy and rhetoric, which basically means that I'm a big nerd when it comes to old dead people. Uh, my goal is to become a public defender and advocate for incarcerated people. Uh, starting out as an intern about uh, over a year ago, uh, I wasn't sure exactly what sort of law I wanted to do. I just knew that I wanted to help people. Uh, but working as an intern, I got to watch black court proceedings and write about what I saw. And some of it was just completely riveting and life changing. Uh, one of those cases was a bail here. It was for a man who had been reportedly seen with something that looked like a bomb. It wasn't actually a bomb. It just looked like one, but because he had a previous felony on his record, uh, just having one thing reported was enough to put a strike. Um, and that was enough to bring it to court. Uh, this man didn't have a home. Uh, he definitely didn't have enough money for bail. Uh, and he was zooming into court from, uh, from jail. Uh, and he was crying uh, that he couldn't afford his $50,000 bail. Um, and instead of listening to him, uh, the court muted him. And so I could just see him shaking and crying, um, just full body crying from this, knowing that this was the worst day of somebody's life. 
Um, so I started writing immediately after. Um, my article about the hearing was actually seen by an advocacy organization uh, that then reached out to us about paying this bail. Uh, and that was incredibly powerful to me uh, to see that I could have that impact. Since that experience, I've realized that I want to be a public defender. Uh, I want to help give a voice to people who are in terrible situations like the one that I saw, like the ones that I see every day now. Um, so now I help coordinate our interns and generally support the Vanguard's mission. I'm also the co-editor-in-chief for the UC Berkeley Vanguard Club uh, with Erzga, who uh, is my co-leader. Uh, we're training even more people to keep their eyes open for injustices in our system. Uh, working with the Vanguard, I feel like I have an active role in illuminating injustices in our world. And I am just so grateful to be involved in this work. Uh, so thank you everybody for supporting here. It is supporting here. Thank you everybody for supporting us and for being here tonight. Thank you so much, truly from the bottom of my heart. Um, yeah, and that's all I have to say. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Alexander Ramirez. I'm currently a fourth year senior at UC Davis. Um, I'm sorry for the lack of a camera. I'm still on campus, but I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk about the Vanguard. Um, so, wow, where do I begin with this? It's probably been the most interesting experience I've had since I enrolled at Davis. Um, wow, where, where do I start with this? It's really changed my thoughts and perspective on the criminal justice system. Uh, mainly when I think about our wrongful conviction cases that we have covered previously, um, what these are is that we talk to someone who is currently incarcerated and they give us their story and we see all the crazy details that they give us and all the, uh, you know, misfortune that they came across and wow, that changed my perspective on the criminal justice system. Before joining the Vanguard, I thought everything was black and white and that justice always prevailed. But after seeing, you know, all these different wrongful conviction cases, all these uh, criminal proceedings, I learned that it's a lot more gray and there's a lot more gray area when it comes to these sorts of cases. And I think that's why organizations like the Vanguard are really important, right? One part of justice is really getting the message out there and making people's stories known. I thought I wanted to become a lawyer before joining the Vanguard. And I'm not gonna say that option is still completely off the table, but I believe reporting in of itself is another huge part of justice and doing what's right. Um, I really appreciate the Vanguard for everything that they've done for me, all the opportunities they've given me and I don't know if I want to become a reporter just yet, but I believe it's something I'm definitely considering. There's a lot more rights you could do other than being a lawyer. Hey everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Erzge. Um, I am a senior at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm studying rhetoric, so I love words and I'm also a nerd. Um, <laughs> I started working with the Vanguard also a year ago. Um, it was July of 2020. Um, I was a pre-law student, emphasis on the was. Um, I was interested in learning more. Um, I was a court watch intern and I was really, I learned so much about um, what David coins the everyday injustices. I think that's a really important phrase um, that I really took out of this because, you know, these courtrooms were just down the street, you know, Alameda, um, Sacramento, and so much bad stuff was happening that I couldn't believe that I was seeing with my eyes. Um, for example, uh, one thing that sticks out to me is uh, I was covering this case. This defendant had this like really bad heart condition and the judge set his bail um, way above what he could pay. Um, and he asked if he could at least go see his doctor to check up on how his heart was doing. And the judge said no. <laughs> and so I was like, that's not, that's not really fair. Um, and I just saw so much stuff like that. So I really learned the importance of reporting. Um, I really fell in love with kind of like the fast paced environment of reporting too. Um, I also worked on the COVID in custody project that Aparna started. 
um, where we were tracking the uh, spread of COVID and the data inside the prisons and jails throughout California. Um, I was focusing on Sacramento County. Um, I noticed that their data was kind of stagnant, which was weird because there's a lot of people crammed in, you know, social distancing wasn't really possible. So I reached out to some people um, who are incarcerated inside and they told me that they were actually having a really hard time getting their early releases granted, even though they had um, they had met the requirements that would allow them to be released early. They were really terrified of catching COVID and dying because they had these serious medical conditions. Um, so I ended up writing uh, two long form like investigative pieces about that. Um, I learned so much. I don't really know the impact of those pieces, but just getting them out there into the world is what honestly matters for me. Um, and yeah, the Vanguard has had offered me so many opportunities. Um, I realized that I do want to be a reporter, so I'm actually applying to journalism school right now. Um, and yeah, it's just really opened up a lot of doors for me and really allowed me to find the intersection between criminal justice and journalism and writing, which I love writing. So thank you all for coming today. And yeah, this has been great. You know, these young people uh, are simply amazing. And I'm really blessed to work with so many outstanding young people. And this was just a small sampling. You know, right now we have over 50 interns across the state. Um, and, and we really are training them to be future lawyers and, and journalists. Um, and so, uh, you know, in 10 years, you're not going to run into a, a lot of lawyers that haven't been through our program, which uh, I, I take great pride in. Um, so unfortunately, Melina had to uh, step out. Um, so we just uh, have wrap and, and Jody to, to finish off this conversation. Um, and uh, so, so my next question, you know, kind of dovetails on some of the things we were talking about before. Are we seeing the beginning of a backlash against reforms or is this kind of a weird moment in time where, uh, you know, we've had this shutdown, um, you know, a lot of uh, courts are not operating at full capacity. I know in San Francisco, they've had a terrible time uh, because people are, are, are stuck in custody uh, sometimes for 200 days, they haven't been, uh, uh, you know, they haven't been granted their speedy trial rights um, and, and they haven't been convicted of anything, but uh, the system has been so slow. Um, so are we seeing a, a, a weird period or are we seeing kind of, uh, you know, a backlash against these reforms? Uh, Rap, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. And I just want to give a shout out to your to your interns. Um, they're just that they're, they're inspirational. You know, we have interns as well, and they observe court themselves. Some of them are high school students, some of them are college students. And I'm always amazed because they have a reaction in court to how how palpable the injustice is, while everyone else in the courtroom, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, um, just find it routine, right? They're just so used to it. And it re reminds me, if I could tell a very quick story, I, I, I took my, my, my wife and I took our kids to DC and we went to the National Museum of African American History, which is an amazing museum that goes through 400 years of history. And you walk up these ramps and it's, it's heavy because you go from slavery to black codes to, to Jim Crow. And we got to the Jim Crow era and my, we were just exhausted, emotionally exhausted. And we decided to leave, go get lunch and come back and finish the next day. And we had lunch and my kids said, daddy, I want to go to the courthouse where you started your practice. And so we went to the DC Superior Courthouse and we sat down in the courtroom where they do first appearance hearings, right? Where people come in the morning after they're arrested. And I knew the judge on the bench. I knew the, the defense lawyers. I knew the, the courtroom personnel from my days there a decade earlier. Um, and they start calling cases and they bring out a young black man, hands shackled and chained to a belt around his waist, take about 30 seconds, move on to the next one, same thing, hands shackled, young black man. And after about five or six of these, my 10-year-old son turns to me and says, Daddy, this is just like that museum. And it dawned on me that here's a 10-year-old child, right, that can recognize that what's happening in a courtroom in the nation's capital is more akin to slavery or Jim Crow than justice. And here is a room full of professionals that have so normalized it, right? I guess, David, what you call 
uh, what is it, ordinary, not ordinary injustice, everyday injustice, yeah. right? And, and so I think it's so good that you have interns seeing this now. And I think the trick is when they go into systems that have accepted injustice, how do they hold on to what is so obvious to them now in a system that desperately wants to, 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 to cause them to abandon those values? So your question, are we looking at a backlash? Um, you know, I, I think that our nation is 400 years of a tug of war, right? There have been ebbs and flows of progress. And for the most part, we have progressed, but it has always been with, you know, victories and defeats, right? Pushes and pulls, ebbs and flows. And I think what we're really seeing now is probably less of a backlash and more of, maybe it's the same thing, maybe this is semantics, but there are people who are invested in the status quo who didn't have to speak up because the status quo was the way things were. And now there's a threat to that. There's a movement that is saying we want change and they are resistant to change. And we are starting to hear them and see them and they're loud because they're threatened. But they were always there. Their views haven't changed. They're just forced to actually express them because there is a loud movement pushing for, for change. And, and, and I want to just share one last thought because I, I see that there are public defenders in the audience. Some of your interns are thinking of being public defenders. And quite frankly, whether you're public defenders or doing any social justice work, what we find, I mean, I, I work with public defenders who are in really, really challenging places, Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Texas. And they come into this work and they have 300 cases and they are forced to bear witness to so much injustice, even though they go to work and they help so much, you can lose sight of, of the good you do when you're surrounded by so much injustice that's beyond your control. And they start to feel defeated, right? And, and there is a symbol, um, sort of a na the national symbol of public defense for some people is a symbol of Sisyphus. Right, you know Sisyphus, the image of Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill, right? It's mythology where he was relegated to spend eternity pushing a boulder up a hill. And every time he got it two steps forward, it would slide two steps back. Some people might call that resistance or backlash. I, I would just call that gravity, right? That's gravity. And there's this boulder that desperately wants to roll down to the bottom of the hill and crush everyone beneath. And, and Sisyphus is holding that boulder. And while the story of Sisyphus, I think is meant to be, it's an image of like hopelessness, like I can't get anywhere. I actually think it's a, a symbol of, of, of hope because here's one person keeping that boulder from rolling down over everyone else. And if it weren't for Sisyphus, right? That boulder, what you describe as maybe backlash would roll down and crush everyone. And there is one person who is determined to not let that happen. And if they can hold on long enough until a second person comes and a third and a fourth, they'll start to move that boulder up the hill. So again, I think I don't call it backlash, I call it resistance. And I think all of the young folks out there who are just thinking about where they fit into this world, right? If they can just join the, 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 the effort to resist that resistance, um, however they fit in, I am optimistic that we'll get where we need to go. And so I think it is just the natural course of history that we experience this. And it's only because there are people like the folks in this room and the audience pushing back so hard that we are seeing that resistance. Well, I just wanted to dovetail on um, one of the points that you made and, and this kind of, you know, uh, somebody on Twitter was uh, was tweaking me earlier this week and say, "Oh yeah, you you guys go and you indoctrinate all these students at UC Davis." You know, the funny thing is is that what we train our interns are are basically two things. One is how to write, and the second thing is uh, is the basics of understanding the law. I don't have to teach them injustice. They figure that part out by themselves. I don't have to preach it. I don't have to, uh, you know, train them on that. I may, I may teach them some things to look at because there are nuances in the system that they miss, but 
you know, when Coda told the story of the, the homeless person, he figured that out all by himself. I didn't need to tell him, uh, <laughs> you know, he knew that that was, was wrong, uh, that, that the system wasn't working right. Um, or, or some would, would say the system was working exactly as it's designed to work. Uh, Jody, your thoughts. Yeah, I, um, first, big up, yes, to the youngins who uh, had a chance to tell us about what they're into, and it, it's promising. Wow, felt good. Um, yeah, the backlash, you know, I don't, I don't care what we want, you know, care particularly what we want to call it. What I saw was remarkable um, in the streets out here. Uh, 18 months ago for six weeks in a row, right? That resulted in all of that movement at the ballot box. Um, that was jaw dropping. You know, George Gascon, you kidding? You know, it, eight years ago, I would have happily bet my house on the, on the proposition that uh, someone like Larry Krasner would not be elected to, as the head DA in Philadelphia, um, having never prosecuted a case in his life, only been a public defender and defense attorney his entire life, and you know, um, and running on a platform of ending mass incarceration, um, police misconduct, and um, cash bail. Um, Seventy-five percent of the voters to vote for him. I would eight years ago, I would have easily bet the house on no, you know, that that's that's not gonna happen. And I'm I'm secure in my bet. <laughs> like I, I have a, it's like having a, a straight flush, you know. I'm you know, I'm not worried about anybody else at the table. Um, but that has what that shows you how much has changed over the last eight years, eight to ten years, right? The Overton window has shifted, it has shifted radically. Uh, so there has been a backlash to that. Yes, there has been, you know, to those victories I just mentioned. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, I hear a lot of people making noises, you know, kind of more vociferously than they used to in the same way that people are now calling anything that's about inclusion, diversity and equity, they're calling it um, critical race theory. You know, critical race theory, labeling any and everything that relates to racial justice, racial, you know, uh, the history of racial injustice in this nation, re re referring to anything uh, that mentions that as a form of critical race theory and intended to indoctrinate and slander and, you know, make people feel like they're victims, of, rather villains of history, you know, and all of that. Um, that's a backlash against those remarkable strides that were made in the street, oh, you know, 18 months ago, you know, and this is, all, this is part of it. I, we knew it was coming, um, no surprise, now it's here. And we have to, uh, I think, do a lot of the things I heard uh, Chasa doing well, you know, have our talking points clear when they bring up the stuff that is, not evidence-based, that is, you know, um, we, one, of the, one of the folks, one of the young uh, folks talked about journalism as an alternative to going into law. I think I, I'm feeling that, I'm feeling them all the way uh, on, you know, if you're today talking about changing the criminal justice outlook, journalism, if I were going in today, when I went in, as a 20 year old, I was deciding what grad school I was gonna to go to. I went to law, I thought that would make the biggest difference. I think journalism, I might be very strongly drawn to journalism, to how they frame the issues, how they report the facts, how they contextualize. Uh, we just had here in California, you know, down in San Diego, a story went viral that a deputy, it was, it was shot by the uh, San Diego Sheriff's Department of a deputy either touching or being in the presence of fentanyl and having an instantaneous overdose. And then they had the, his, his, his supervisor, I'm going to hold you. I'm, you're not going to, we're not going to let you go. We're, we're going to keep you. We're going to get you through this. And it was very melodramatic. You know, the, you have the music, all the rest. Okay. Um, 
there is, it was a single sourced article. They talked only to law enforcement. It went from there to the San Diego Union Tribune, to the LA Times, to CNN, to, you know, to ABC, to NBC. You know, it shows you how bad drugs are. Look how bad they are. You can even get a whiff in an instant overdose so the war on drugs is justified. And look at our brave officers out there doing their thing. This is anti-vaxxer, flat earth stuff. You know, it really straight up is. There is not, it's not like there's a little countervailing evidence. You know, there, this is straight, you know, the, the, the sun goes around the earth stuff. Right. It really is. But we saw that in the, in the police department a lot, you know, with refusal to take vaccinations and a lot got a lot of anti-vaxxer kind of not listening to evidence based kinds of uh, uh, re, uh, arguments a lot. Um, so, yeah, this is our, our moment to, you know, hold on to the conversation, change it through journalism about criminal justice, as well as through public defenders, through the law but through all the organs we're going to need working together to keep, to make this happen. Yeah. And, you know, you guys are great um, because, you know, I, I like alternate between pessimism and optimism. And, uh, you know, I do, I, I do agree. You have to look at really the big picture. I remember right after George Floyd died, I think it was Al Sharpton uh, gave one of the addresses and, and he talked about being down in Mississippi uh, in, in the 60s and, and this white college age girl like spat in his face and, and yelled, N word, go home. And then he's telling the story that he's, I, I think he was in Philadelphia and uh, he feels this tug on his jacket and this uh, little uh, 11 year old white girl is there and he, he's like bracing for the abuse. And, and, and she pumps her fist and she goes, no justice, no peace. And he's like, yeah, you know, this is a different time. Um, it, was, it was a really moving moment that, that just kind of reminds you that, okay, we're not where we were in the 60s, you know, even though, you know, some of the things are continuing uh, from that time. Um, so let me go to the, the final question and then we can take a few audience questions. Um, so from your perspective, um, you know, what can we do to solve things like mass incarceration, police accountability, and, um, and maybe biggest, you know, racial inequity in the criminal legal system? Let's start with Jody. Um, for me, the just quickest thing right off the bat is what the hell are police doing? For example, in Beverly Hills, I just saw, this was uh, in the papers, speaking of journalism, a couple of days ago um, here, that the Beverly Hills cops, when they were policing Rodeo Drive, 90% um, of the folks that they descend, that they stopped and frisked for jaywalking, 90% were black, 2% of Beverly Hills is black, 90% of the stops, okay? Um, why, are we, uh, why are we putting cops in the business of enforcing jaywalking laws, number one? You know, let, let me just start there. Uh, look in the history of jaywalking, by the way, where it came from. It, it, there's no evidence that, it, that, that they're doing so, it makes us safer, number one, which is what they're normally gonna throw up. You look at the evidence, see what it says, number one. And then number two, look at, you know, kind of how it is the product of some political decisions made right here in California. L.A. gave them the model back in the 20s when the cars wanted to dominate the road, you know, pedestrians, cars. Well, we're going to give the right of way to the cars and start blaming the pedestrians for all the slaughter that's happening because cars are hitting all these people on the road by call, talking about their, their bad behavior, their jaywalking and all the like. Not only not that kind of stuff that they are constantly in the business of, but you know, traffic violations. Look at all of you know from from, from Palando Castile to just you go down the line, Sandra Bland, all the profile stopping stuff, right? Why are they in the business of traffic? You know, we know why they're only working, they're only responding four or five. You'll get bearing four or five, six percent of their time to any kind of violent crime. 
right? That means they got 96% of their time to fill, right? They, they got to sit back and, and, and feel, what am I going to do with this 95% of my time? Um, let me go out here and, you know, just get in the business of, you know, uh, stopping a lot of cars or uh, stopping, you know, jamming up people for jaywalking or whatever. So getting police out of our lives in all the ways possible, recognizing that implicit bias that I started writing about over 25 years ago, before it was called that, you know, we talked about bias concentrated in the cognitive unconscious. We used to be hopeful that maybe through implicit bias training, we could, we could work against those mental reflexes, root out unconscious bias. We can't, the, early, the, re, the, the data, you know, I've had a, I've had to acknowledge, you know, because I, I, I used to be one of the optimistic, maybe we could do it. No, you can do very little about these mental reflexes from implicit bias training and all that. So if you want to minimize the harm to black communities from and other members of stereotype groups, black communities from officers who have stereotypes about them that they're going to use to cause a disproportionate harm to them, the way you're going to do it is not by training it out of the officer. You're going to have to minimize the contacts because it's intractable. I'm sorry. You're going to talk about, about something Sisyphean or Sisyphusian. You know, that is, it, it's not going anywhere. It's intractable. So what you want to do is minimize the contacts between them and the members of the communities that their uncontrollable, unconscious biases are going to make them disproportionately harm. right? That's all you got to do. To, you know, unbundle them, defund them, whatever it is you want to call it. And, and minimize their footprint. And then so put them on the things they really, we really want them to do, you know, which is address, you know, the stuff that they're not addressing. Like Chase Boudin was talking out, talking about, you know, I, I'm getting three out of a hundred, you know, and you're blaming me as the DA. Rap? So I, I think I'll just continue to, to, to sort of hit on what I've been hitting on. And that is the idea that I think Ultimately, all those, all these things, mass incarceration, um, police, abusive policing, um, racial inequity um, are, are part of our culture, right? That, that I mean, I, I, I agree with Jody, we can't just make rules and say, stop being racist, right? Stop mistreating people. We are guided by our values. When I first started sort of recognizing the cultural problem, when I came to Georgia, I did a lot of research on culture and there was no one talking about it in the criminal legal space, but, but a lot the, the people who talk about culture are in the business world. They, they recognize culture makes and break industry and it really is just deep seated values that are embraced by a collection of people. And quite frankly, the people in our criminal legal system from police to prosecutors, to judges, to even many defense lawyers, embrace a corrupted set of values. And if we don't ultimately change those values, all of the policy work and tweaks we make are only going to be sort of band-aids on a larger problem. There is a, there is a, um, a video I, I frequently show when we're doing leadership training with our public defender leaders. And it's a video of a man who was the elected representative of the public defenders in Tennessee. He was the president of the Tennessee Public Defender Commission. He was elected by the other public defenders to, to, to speak for them. And he was at a budget hearing. And he was asked a very simple question. Do you have enough resources? He said, let me tell you something. I have a five county district. I have five courthouses. He said, I have five lawyers and one investigator. He said, last year we closed 4,000 cases. Okay, that's 800 cases per lawyer. And he went on to say, so let me assure you, there is one district in Tennessee that has enough. He said, we're blessed. He said, I'm blessed to have the seasoned lawyers I have. And he talked about them with admiration by saying they are good at processing. They're efficient. They are time savers. Literally, those were the adjectives he used with pride to describe his lawyers, processors. And I will say to our leaders, I don't believe that man came out of law school 30 years ago saying, you know what I want to do with my life? I want to help send 800 people a year into cages. I think I'll be a public defender, right? right? I don't believe that. I believe he entered a system that slowly and subtly shaped him into a lawyer he never would have recognized as a law student. 
I don't believe is a particularly weak individual. I believe most of us, if we enter a system that corrupted with no intervention, no support, we may not be shaped that badly, but we will be shaped in ways that we don't recognize. And I think that while we have to elect less punitive prosecutors and better judges, we have to think about policy reforms that make sense. Um, that doesn't get us where we need to go if it is not coupled with a long-term strategy to change the values of the people who administer justice in America. It's hard, it's hard to get our hands around. We can't imagine doing it in a timeline that we'll live to see. And so we tend to look at quicker policy fixes, but those policy fixes are just detours for people who want to engineer outcomes inconsistent with justice. I support them, but if they're not coupled with genuine culture change, none of these problems you just asked about, David, will really be transformed. All right. So. Um... Coda, uh, do we have any audience questions uh, in our last 15 minutes or so? Yes, we do. Let me turn my camera back on. Uh, so my first question is, can the panel speak to how to combat forces trying to force uh, voting out of the office? Could you repeat that? I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. So sorry about that. Can the panel speak to how to combat forces trying to force Chessa out of office? Oh, gotcha. Well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll dive in real quickly. Um, part of it goes to what Rap was saying, I think, um, you know, helping to change the culture, reorient, you, you know, um, make the culture responsive to evidence rather than fact-free fear-mongering, which is, you know, we're seeing in real time, firsthand. Um, the thing is, you know, eight, nine years ago, th there was just a smaller group of us who would see it and complain about it, but you just have a lot more eyes, you know, folks like us sitting around, and I, I see conversations like this going on all over the nation now, that weren't there eight, nine years ago, that really kind of heart, give me, you know, I, I do feel heartened by. Um, but, you know, so weighing in, um, uh, I saw Rod Radley Balco of the Washington uh, Post uh, uh, tightened up some local uh, station in San Francisco about bias reporting against uh, Chesa, uh, for example. Um, and. Some other journalists are, are pointing out that, you know, some of the, the journalism in San Francisco is not as being as responsible as it should be when it comes to reporting on Chesa. Um, all, and, and I think they're responding to it. You know, one, one of the things I'm finding a good about, uh, you know, the, the Twitter and some of the social media is um, when we, you know, when the LA Times got a lot of blowback from a lot of us about the fentanyl uh, story, they started backpedaling and they finally published a retraction outright. You know, we said, we don't want just a little bit of, no, no, no mealy mouth, come out and say, you know, we want misinformation kills, right? Misinformation kills, whether we're talking COVID, whether we're talking the war on drugs, so come on, LA Times, and they and they were responsive. So I think you know helping weighing in as much as we can in some of those areas is, is just one of the ways I think uh, that that we can help. Yeah. So so I will say you know I mean I, I I am I'm a stranger to San Francisco and I don't know the the the, the community and the dynamics there. But but you all have a wonderful resource. My guess is many people on this in this audience know. Raj Jayadev, who, who runs Silicon Valley Debug, and he, um, is the brain he, he, he is the brainchild of this idea of participatory defense, which really just imagines uh, public defenders working in alliance with community to harness community power and bring it into the courtroom and also to harness 
the power of public defenders in spaces where they speak to better advocate for community. And it's a, a synergy between the two. And I, it just makes me think, um, again, I don't know the players and the actors and the levers, but, 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 but right now, I think as Chesa acknowledged, um, this, is a this is a narrative battle, right? This is a battle about a narrative about his office and whether what they are doing is making the community less safe or more safe, healthier or less healthy. And I think there are natural allies, at, at communities that would never align with prosecutors in the past that actually are probably very um, uh, 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 sort of ripe terrain to pull in to partner in this effort to think about how they get out a more accurate message and how to mobilize them to themselves be engaged when this recall happens to give Chesa support. So, so I think for a lot of you connected to communities, I think the question is how do you get them understanding that they're under attack? When Chesa's under attack, they're under attack and how can they mobilize to help fend off this effort? Could I another question? Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, so this next question, because we're running a little low on time, I'm going to summarize the first part of it. So I'm very sorry about that if I'm not representing it fully. Uh, but somebody says, um, I recently had the privilege of witnessing a movement to return stolen land to the Black descendants in a wealthy community called Manhattan Beach nearby. It had originally belonged to uh, Willa and Charles Bruce, um, but the white residents of the city often harassed and overtly discriminated against Black families that would visit the beachfront. Uh, and eventually, the property was seized to be built as a park. Uh, just this year, the movement managed to get Governor Newsom to sign into law the transfer of this highly valuable property back to the couple's descendants. Uh, so their question is, how can a community recognize its history but still move forward towards creating a more inclusive region? That's a big question. Um, I mean, I've got, I've, I've got some thoughts. Jody, can, can I you jump know, in please, and share a few please, things? And, please. So, you, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I, I read about that story. It was, a, it was an amazing story. Um, and, you know, I teach in a law school. It's one of the rare law schools in America where over 50% of our students are black and brown students, um, very rare in law school. And I teach, I teach a class called criminal justice lawyering. And we read um, a number of books, the new Jim Crow, Just Mercy, we read articles. And, and, and I'm always amazed to find how little my students understand history. Um, and, and I think that for those of us in academia, um, I think we need to be thinking about how we can teach our students who are going to go on to become, whether they're lawyers or whether they're business leaders or whether they're politicians, some of the history that you're talking about um, and, and, and help them develop strategies to think about how to rectify some of these past injustices. Because my concern is that um, most people, quite frankly, are quite ignorant of many of the things that are going on. They don't understand what you just posed in your question. And so um, I don't know, I don't think they're indifferent. They're literally unaware. And, and, and so I think as educators, we need to think about how to weave that into our teaching, but also certainly through internships and through other things. How, how do we teach history? Right? And, and I think as Jody mentioned earlier, nowadays, if you teach any history that, that uh, challenges the dominant white narrative, it's labeled critical race theory and you can't teach it, but, but that makes it more challenging, but it doesn't mean we don't need to figure out how to do it. Jody? Yeah, um, you, are, you do run that constant risk now of being called a critical race theorist if you bring up historical racism, even current day racism for that matter, which, the, the, which many will deny the existence of current day, 
and also say we shouldn't learn about any past iterations of it and shut it all out in that way. And yeah, a lot of people are going to look at the Bruce story, not in as heartening a way as we do, in as uplifting a way as we do, right? Uh, a lot of people are seeing that as, again, part of the culture wars, critical race theory thinking, reparations. What do you mean reparations? Well, we're, how far do these reparations extend? And, you know, there is a concern that sometimes if you're saying the reparations only encompass findings that are this clear, where a, a Black family can go back and say, here are the deeds and here are the actions and here are the players and some of them are still around and, and, and you can make a case with that kind of you know, uh, airtight solidity. Well, yeah, but if that's what it takes to get something like reparations and racial justice, um, that not many black folk are gonna satisfy those criteria. You know, those are, those are, you know, a lot of us don't have, we can't go back and say, a lot of us were in situations where you can't say we own land, for example, a big parcel of land, and then it was taken. Many of us did, that did happen for sure. But many of us, you know, uh, like I, my family and all the families around me, none of us were landowners. We were laborers all our lives and our, and our parents were laborers and the parents before them were laborers, right? Um, and we own, you, you know, we own some things, but um, so, you know, I, as far as how to even think about um, that acknowledgement, well, do you want to really then, forgetting the people who right now, who see it as a part of a culture war and hate it for that reason. And that's a good number of people. We should recognize that they almost won the last, they did win two elections ago. They got uh, people with, uh, who share that point of view, uh, 73, 74 million votes the last time around. Um, and, um, you know, have a good chance of getting a lot of, a, a lot of those kind of votes, you know, coming. So there are a lot of people who, who feel that way about this inclusion, diversity and equity stuff. But putting those as folks aside for a moment, um, to reach out to the other people who say, yeah, okay, that's justice. Yeah, that's a kind of reparation. I can see that. When somebody had, you know, tangible land taken from them wrongfully, then to have it returned really is consonant with my conception of justice. Then to challenge them and say, okay, consistent with that, can't you see the case for reparations more generally? How, can't you see how people who they were not able to purchase land but had their opportunities to purchase land taken from them by things like redlining? should also be entitled to that kind of consideration. And so, and then you go, you can start to really broaden the scope, right? And, and, turn, and have people recognize that, you know, reparations isn't such a far-fetched idea as people used to think and finding ways to express the spirit of reparations, even in the criminal law. What, would the, what, what do reparations look like in the criminal law? You know, can we come up with that, what that would even look like, right? And then what does it look like in other areas? So it, it's, it, you know, it, it could be uh, that we are talking about it now and that it invites this kind of critical self-reflection uh, means it was a good thing, I suppose, even though I think I'm not sure if it moved the needle in some bigger way. All right, time for one more question. You're muted. I said, um, <laughs> so you didn't okay. get as much, I promise. Uh, I said, um, because we've got two really good questions and I'm kind of just debating. Well, let's um, just do okay. a bulk. Okay. We'll, we'll stay over five minutes. So the first one is, uh, curious to know your thoughts about the role of probation and how you view them in this era of criminal justice reform. Although they provide supervision system involved individuals, they also provide programs and resources to assist with transformation of system impacted youth and emerging adults. Do you see probation as vital in the discussion of reform? So do you wanna take that first or you want me to? I'll just real quickly because I don't know much, uh, very much about it, frankly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, go to you, uh, Rap, and, and, um, and learn. Let me, just, let me just learn, I know my lane. <laughs> I have, a, I have a feeling you could answer that 
thoroughly if 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 you if you uh, had to. But but I, I'll tell you my my view is um, so. Look, I think for many people, because people will do anything to get out of a cage, uh, probation is a welcome alternative to incarceration, but we've got to be better than that, right? And so uh, what I have learned from my work as a public defender and working with hundreds of public defenders, uh, I think it's safe to say probation is largely a setup, right? It is, it is a system where you are, where burdens and are, are placed on you. And when you almost inevitably fail to live up to them, you're just right back looking at, 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 at being incarcerated. It almost always comes with costs where you have to pay exorbitant amounts of money to get treatment or you know, to take buses because many folks don't have cars to get to their appointments. And, and so I think what I really worry about is are we going to trade one form of incarceration for another. And I think Michelle Alexander so eloquently lays out this sort of evolution from slavery to black codes to Jim Crow to mass incarceration. What is the next evolution, right? We can end mass incarceration, but if we don't change our desire to ensure certain people remain second-class citizens, we'll find something else. And maybe that something else is electronic monitoring and something that looks like probation. So I guess my response, my final response is, when you say people can get treatment and services they need, that may be true, but why do they need to get them through pro probation? If people need services and they're not dangerous, if they have, if they have, if they're struggling with substance abuse or mental illness, or, 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 or they don't have homes or jobs um, or education. Let's find them services outside of the criminal legal system, which almost inevitably leads back to a punitive, classist, racist system of punishment. All right, Kodo, ask the last question. All right, this one's more broad. Uh, what are some things that can be done that can have a real impact on changing the culture? Well, one of the things that I'm doing, and this, this is fitting that wrap gets to wrap us up here. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I'm doing is uh, trying to incorporate art into our rhetorical response, right? Because this is about rhetoric, right? This is about persuasion. This is why the, the lawyers and rhetoricians overlap in that a lawyer hardly ever opens her or his mouth or does anything with her or his pen in, in which they're not trying to persuade somebody or something, right? You're trying to, you, we're a professional persuader. So rhetoric is our tool, kind of our stock and trade, right? And one, what I found is one of the most powerful so, sources of kinds of rhetoric out here is not just our logical arguments, but art itself. You know, I put on a play over at Bovar 10 years ago, I'm gonna have a second part now called Race, Rap and Redemption, in which I had um, live performances by Macy Gray's uh, Music Orchestra, uh, Lula Washington Dance Company, Saul Williams, Maida Devalle, Ice Cube Live, and it was all around, the call of the question for the evening was, should we pour liquor for Tukey? Stanley Tukey Williams had just been put to death by Arnold Schwarzenegger when he denied the state uh, uh, petition. And, um, and the question to this urban audience of USC students where, you know, urban audiences are especially antsy about crime. You know, so yeah, I'm, I'm arguing, I'm, I'm, you know, this is a closing argument for the dam before a hostile jury in a lot of ways, you know, 1,100 people in the auditorium, but it's a hostile jury. Um, and I'm trying to have them sympathetically identify with a first degree murderer who co-founded the Crips, right? And I knew I wasn't going to get there with a lot of, you know, flourishes of the legal lexicon. You know, I wasn't going to get there with a lot of, you know, kind of, uh, I, you know, just kind of, uh, 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 legalistic arguments or any kind of um, though any kind of, of that kind of argument, I was going to need the arguments to come out of art, 
and out of those live performances that invite sympathetic identification, that invite you to change your narrative perspective, right? And, 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 and occupy the perspective of the people we're criminalizing because that's what a lot of the rap does. You know, when you have somebody like Ice Cube saying, fuck the police coming straight from the underground, young nigga got it bad because I'm brown, not the other color, so police think they have the authority to kill a minority, right? That is oppositional political discourse that, it, that anticipates Black Lives Matter by 25 years. So art really can be a galvanizing influence. And by, at the, by the end of that night, you had, as you can see in the video that's online, you have 1,100 USC student faculty and staff standing up with their lighters in the air for Stanley Tukey Williams. Because, not because of anything I was saying, but because of the power of art, right? And its ability to move you and to, and to change your narrative perspective and to take you to places you wouldn't otherwise see yourself going. So for me, it'd be art. All right, man, I gotta follow that. Um, that was powerful, I appreciate that. Let, let me say before I start, I, I'm putting my email in the chat room. So if anyone does wanna reach out, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to continue this conversation with those of you um, who, who are thinking about public defense or criminal justice in a way that, that I've been talking about. But, but um, so I guess it gives me a chance to plug my book again because my book is really all about our, our model to transform culture in public defender offices. And so when I talk about culture, there's sort of culture change societally. Um, I'm, I'm really sort of talking about how do we change the culture of organizations, public defender offices, DA's offices, police offices, right? How do we change organizational culture? And we have a pretty, um, a pretty straightforward model we developed. I, I think in a nutshell, um, everything I understand about culture is that it starts with a leader introducing a new set of values, a set of, of, of core values that the leader wants the organization to embrace. You then develop policies and processes so that people act consistently with those values. And, and when they meet with success, they internalize them and those values become internalized. And when they're so deeply internalized that they're second, second nature, they're assumptions. And when a whole organization embraces the same set of assumptions, you shifted value. Now that probably takes a generate, I'm sorry, you shifted culture. Now that probably takes a generation to do. We started doing this work in New Orleans with the public defenders in 2006 after Katrina. 14 years later, you can see a real cultural transformation in that public defender's office, um, but it took a long time. And so we engage in something that we call values-based recruitment, values-based training, values-based mentorship, values-based leadership development. We recruit lawyers who are open to embracing a certain set of human-centered, client-centered values. All of our training, it's not just skills, it is how do you practice consistently with those values and how do you have strategies to resist pressures to abandon them? We have values-based mentorship where everyone has mentors in a community that in the real world helps them think about how they deal with real world problems consistent with those values when they run into them. And ultimately, we're developing them into tomorrow's leaders who will actually build organizations that are shaped by those values. So that's uh, a whole lot in a few minutes. This has been great. Um, David, I really appreciate you inviting me. Jody, it's been a pleasure uh, being in conversation with you. Uh, Cody, you're the man, along with all the other interns. Um, appreciate y'all, and I appreciate the audience and all the chats. Thank you both of you for sticking it out. Um, I'm sorry that uh, Melina had to leave um, because she's got a very important perspective. Um, and I'm sorry that Chase uh, wasn't able to make it. Uh, but I wanna thank everybody for, for coming. Uh, thank you everybody for, for your support. 